Good morning everybody and very welcome to the 35th AMSAD UK colloquium held with the RSGB convention. I'm sorry I can't be with you but I hope uh, you will have a very enjoyable colloquium and I'll just take a few moments to bring you an update on some of the space activities that have been going on at uh, SSTL in the last couple of years. But before I give you that update, I would like to just spend a few moments to recognize the passing of a, an old friend, Richard G3RWL, who contributed so much to AMSAT, um, not only in generating the bulletins in the early days of the internet, which were carried worldwide by USAT2, but also his participation with you know, his, his very characteristic uh, uh, humor uh, and presence in many AMSAT colloquia. Rest in peace, Richard. So by way of a very short introduction to all the satellites that we produce at uh, Surrey, ranging on the right-hand side from small CubeSats, nano satellites, through the micro satellites weighing 50 to 100 kilos to mini satellites you know, weighing between three to 600 kilos, and then indeed actually up to our largest spacecraft, Quantum, which uh, weighed several tons. These satellites all have a whole range of different applications, communications, Earth observation, both optical and radar, and uh, of course contributing some 34 payloads to the uh, European Galileo navigation and timing system. Since 2009, I guess over the last uh, three to four years, we've been pretty busy. We've had 13 different launches and we've launched 32 different satellites for a whole range of, of different folks. So obviously Galileo was one where we were very busy with 10 launches uh, in, in 10 satellites launched uh, for Kazakhstan, um, for Japan, uh, looking at uh, uh, space debris removal. Uh, former sat uh, for Taiwan, uh, looking at uh, um, GPS occultation to improve weather forecasting, um, radar and optical spacecraft, uh, and indeed remove debris mission, which if you look and put remove debris into your uh, search engine, you will come up with a video which shows the um, in orbit uh, 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 demonstrations of different techniques for space debris uh, removal. So from Earth observation, pictures are much more interesting than, than just words. And here is a video clip from one of our tiny satellites, Carbonite 2, which is taking video of this aircraft taking off along the runway from about 500 kilometers up in orbit. And again, a video from the Carbonite 2 satellite here showing traffic running along the motorway. You can clearly see the cars and the trucks. And if you look really carefully, you can just see the cloud slowly uh, drifting across the scene. Yeah, 2023 is a really busy year. We have nine spacecraft currently under construction. We have the second spacecraft for HOTSAT for satellite view, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, in just a moment. We just delivered a satellite for Thailand, uh, when it's currently in Thailand, waiting for launch in uh, hopefully in January. We're building the first project, uh, first satellite for the UK MOD, and a technology demonstration satellite to, for Ox with Oxford Space Systems to demonstrate a very a deployable dish antenna for uh, radar. A synthetic aperture radar microsatellite for Norway to look at uh, maritime surveillance. And we've just uh, started a project with the Philippines to build an Earth observation satellite for them. And then some really exciting activities SSTL Luna, and I'm going to talk a bit about that in a moment, and a satellite for uh, the European Space Agency called HydroGNSS, which I will cover in just a moment. Our latest satellite, SatVU or HotSat, <coughs> was uh, launched just in uh, September this year. <coughs> this is a, a really a novel spacecraft. It's the first time that a microsatellite has been doing thermal imaging from orbit. And this thermal imaging has a resolution of about three and a half uh, uh, meters. And the intention is to be able to detect heat flow from buildings. 
And again, pictures speak louder than words. So here are a few images. Uh, this first one from uh, Albuquerque in New Mexico. And what's really interesting here is in the bottom of the middle of the picture, you can see red is hot, blue is dark. And in the bottom uh, of the center of the picture, you can see a golf course. You can also see a number of the buildings where the dark blue shows they have really good heat insulation but you can also see the roads are really warm. And then when you look into the in, uh, individual streets, you can see which houses are cooler, which houses are warmer, which houses have good uh, insulation and those which have poorer insulation. So there are many applications of this type of mission, you know, clearly from looking at the heat losses from domestic buildings, also from uh, installations. Uh, but also we can have commercially valuable information on activities uh, showing which uh, particular plants are active and which ones are in operation, which ones are perhaps in standby. Again, an example here taken over the uh, John Lennon Airport in, uh, uh, in England, uh, where we can see in the left hand picture the essentially the heat from the aircraft because the aircraft have a lower emissivity uh, than the surrounding uh, ground and therefore they appear a little bit darker in shade but we also see that the um, the airport building in red uh, is much darker than the surrounding things so it has a very low emissivity so that's you know, very low heat loss and then finally in this sequence an interesting picture uh, demonstrating the use of this technology for fire detection and, and monitoring. Here is a, a wildfire that was detected in the Doverstone Reservoir just 20 minutes after it uh, broke out and it sort of demonstrated the application of this for wildfire monitoring, something that now is unfortunately becoming very widespread. And still on the uh, Earth observation theme, but using a different technique in this case. So we're not using optical or radar infrared sensing, but rather we're using the signals that bathe the surface of the Earth continuously from the uh, Global Positioning System and Galileo satellites, uh, which we use, of course, for navigation and timing all the time. Um, however, instead of using it for uh, uh, positioning and timing, uh, in this case, we're looking at the reflected signals from the GNSS spacecraft off the surface of the Earth. And by receiving these rather weak signals with a, uh, a satellite in low Earth orbit and processing that data, we can learn a lot about the surface of the Earth. In terms of the Earth itself on the land, we can measure biomass and we can measure soil moisture content, which are becoming increasingly important. And indeed, when it's over the oceans, we can also uh, determine the ocean uh, surface roughness. So, for example, we can uh, get an indication of significant wave height uh, and that will allow ships to avoid storms and to have perhaps more optimum routing from A to B. This was a, an interesting project because it actually started some 20 years ago as a research project in the Surrey Space Centre at the University. Uh, initially, everybody said that this was an impossible technique to get anything valuable out of it. But a series of experimental payloads on a whole range of our satellites over the last 20 years gradually demonstrated that it scientifically was possible to get valuable data out of it. And now we have the first operational mission for the European Space Agency, uh, which will be using this to measure as biomass. And finally, for me, perhaps the most exciting of our missions, been long in planning. It was on our roadmap back in the year 2000. And we uh, have had various studies and activities going on since then. But now finally SSTL is on its way to the moon with the mission called Lunar Pathfinder. This is, as the name suggests, a Pathfinder mission for the European Space Agency Moonlight uh, constellation, which is to provide communications, uh, positioning, navigation, timing uh, around the moon, rather like GPS and uh, Galileo do for uh, the Earth. But in addition to provide a communications link back to Earth, to and from the Earth, in fact, um, for a whole range of the upcoming lunar missions, both those that will be orbiting the moon and those that will be on the lunar surface. Uh, 
So the concept is to be able to provide this relay, so it's a little bit like a Vodafone around the moon, to pick up signals and transfer data from these packages on the lunar surface or small satellites around the moon and to provide a pipeline back to Earth for that data. And this is a, a mission that's being carried out and uh, as a commercial activity uh, funded by ESA and NASA as the initial customers for this service, but other agencies and, and uh, projects are likely to join in and to provide this as a commercial service for the communications and timing around the moon for these new uh, lunar explorations. And Lunar Pathfinder will indeed be launched in 2025 and one of its first objectives will be to support uh, returning data from a NASA lunar lander on the far side of the moon. So with that quick overview on activities over the last few years here at uh, Surrey, um, I really hope that you will have a very enjoyable and productive colloquium. And uh, of course, many thanks to all of those who have gone into the organization of it, both in AMSAT UK and the support from BATG in terms of being able to uh, web stream our activities. Enjoy the time and uh, hopefully, maybe next year, I will see you in person. I do apologize, by the way, for my, um, my picture jumping around on the screen, but it's always difficult to fit it in amongst the various graphics. Best wishes. Well, if you're watching, Martin, thank you very much indeed. It's amazing to think that all those activities grew out of a young radio amateur getting involved in trying to build spacecraft. Uh, I was going to say in his, on his kitchen table, but uh, something like that many years ago, of course.